citizens are often reduced to the role of political elites and different paradigms of authoritarianism or securitization. And in this sense, this neglects not only everyday forms of resistance, but also the efforts of advanced capitalist states to contain the uprisings, as well as the different counter revolutionary forces operating in the region. So with the second wave of, of the uprisings, which began in 2018, once again, we are facing a crisis, but the crisis is not temporary and it's not simply contemporary either. It's deep, structural and historical. So as we sit here today, there are protests ongoing in Lebanon, um, Tunisia, uh, while the Moroccan state is cracking down on activists and people vaguely associated with the left in an effort to contain this crisis. And for all these reasons, this book is particularly important because it challenges all these pessimistic readings of resistance and revolutionary processes. Um, it places all these movements in their own historical and material context. And at the same time, it generates a really vibrant dialogue between uh, brilliant scholars and activists, which we are uh, privileged to have here today. Sorry, I get anxious and I lose my voice. Uh, but yeah, which we are really privileged to have here today. Um, so without further ado, I am going to introduce them. So we have Jade Saab, who is a Lebanese um, Canadian writer and activist. Uh, he's doing a PhD at the University of Glasgow. And then we have uh, Frida Afari, who is a librarian, translator, uh, producer of um, Iranian progressives in translation, as well as co-founder of the Alliance of Middle East and, and North African Socialists. Um, and then we have uh, also Joey Ayoub, who is uh, a Leban Lebanese Palestinian scholar activist, who's finishing a PhD at the University of Zurich. Um, so up to the speakers, thank you. Thanks for that, Miriam. That's a very great introduction and I hope, uh, I hope to live up to all the great things you said about us and, uh, in the book. Um, I thought I'd start this by kind of bringing the conversation into a bit of context, especially now that we're marking 10 years of, uh, of the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, so I wanted to start by maybe reflecting on the so-called Arab Spring, tying it to these movements, and then diving into a bit of an overview into the movements themselves and what they have in common with each other. Um, the first ma mass movement we saw in the region, the one that swept Egypt, Tunisia, Syria, Libya, Yemen, and others, uh, it was covered in the media in kind of an almost explicitly Orientalist way. It really minimized the differences between the countries, it limited their explanation to kind of a common identity. You know, that's why it was called the Arab uh, Spring. Uh, and it was, it was also placed in a narrative that retroactively justified interventionism in the region after the invasion of Iraq. This was only a few years after the invasion of Iraq. And then once these uprisings happened, uh, the media portrayed it in a way like, oh, finally, democracy has kind of come to the region. You know, now that we've, we've imported it through the form of an illegal invasion, everyone has kind of learned the lesson and, and we're now having this kind of explosion of dem democracy and the people finding their voice, et cetera. Um, so, so that's why these events were presented in this ahistoric uh, lens. Uh, it, it completely ignored the long struggles uh, which culminated in these uprisings and were a part of each of these countries' uh, history. And, uh, and they were presented as kind of a beginning of history in the region, which uh, funnily enough fell in line with the simplistic perspectives of an end of history approach. You know, in that the only way that history can move forward now is through the embrace of liberal ideology through democracy. So we see with the end of history in the West after the end of the Cold War, finally the beginning of history in the Middle East through interventionism, through uh, these revolts themselves, completely ignoring the fact that results, uh, revolts have happened in the past. Um, 
And, and this was kind of consistent with what was happening in the uh, around the globe at the time. Uh, it reflected kind of the global uh, balance of power. Uh, and in, it was only until the failure of some of these revolutions uh, and their degeneration into long and bitter civil wars, as we've seen in Yemen, Syria, and Libya, that we've seen kind of a reversal in Western hegemony in the region. But what that has also meant is a heightened sense of imperialist competition in the region, both in an international level with Russia and US, for example, and in a regional level with Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, so once the 2018 and 2019 uprisings, the ones we cover in this book emerged, the media didn't give them this kind of attention as they did with the Arab Spring. Uh, the end of history narrative itself no longer applied, uh, and there was also a bit of a lack of novelty. These uprisings also were happening in a global context where you saw, you saw kind of anti-austerity, anti-neoliberal protests happen across the globe. So, you know, this ties in with why they didn't receive that much coverage. Uh, when they did get kind of coverage, they were referred to in many places as Arab Spring 2.0. Uh, in a way, this wanted to show the continuity of the original Arab Spring, but uh, but there's the more interesting discussion, I think, with the second wave is it kind of challenges this narrative of the Arabness of these revolts. Uh, in Algeria, for example, a key demand for the movement was the recognition of Berber and Amazigh rights. So it was exclusive. It was almost against the sense of an Arab, uh, for an exclusively Arab identity and an Arab hegemony that has been forced in the region from previous movements. Some of them also being left-leaning or state capitalist. Um, the inclusion of Iran in this book, uh, or in the last wave, also, uh, you know, shows that this is this goes beyond some kind of Arab identity. That's not really the collective uh, factor. If one can at all talk about, you know, an Arab uh, identity and distill that in some way. Um, and yeah, what they also shared is that all of these movements were explicitly more social and economic oriented than simple calls of democratization, which we saw in the first wave. Uh, and they were also found in countries that already had democracies, such as Lebanon and Iraq. Uh, this definitely is not to undermine the first wave and say that they didn't have social and economic components. Of course they did but they were kind of swept under the rug in favor of the simplistic democratization narrative. Uh, so we see from the second wave that it's not identity that unites all these movements. Uh, it's more their position in the global economy and the relation with global capitalism. The political economy of the region is predominantly rentier or statist capitalist. Uh, it's overly focused on extracting oil and natural gas. It has underdeveloped manufacturing sections, overdeveloped service sectors, all of which fuel various forms of speculative investments, such as real estate and a heavy reliance of banking and bank secrecy and, and all of that. Um, so historically, what this means is that the way these countries themselves have developed differently, uh, some of them can be uh, referred to as patrimon sorry, patrimonial states, where one family holds power, such as Assad in Syria. We have neo-patrimonial states where the military establishment itself and not a single family has held on to power, such as Egypt or Sudan and Algeria. Uh, and then you have these democracies that present some kind of power sharing mechanism justified as the only way to maintain fragile internal balances, but it is really also a way to maintain kind of an oligarchical presence of a ruling class. Um, so we need to see these, all of these regimes, no matter how differently they function, uh, through the role in the world economy as subordinate nations providing cheap labor, resources, and a market for industrialized nations. Uh, this has impacted, of course, the national economies themselves, but it's also distorted the region's development as a whole. And with these power structures, everyday workers have been shut out of the spoils that have been really gained through this extractivist nature. And this has produced migration of skilled labor out of the region, massive rates of unemployment and underemployment, especially among young people. So all of this has created a kind of pre-revolutionary situation. Uh, the absence of, uh, oops, sorry, I lost my trail of thought. 
the absence of the, the uh, political agency, the ability to kind of raise your voice through normal processes, and the growing impoverishment of the masses in a climate of corruption and increasing social inequalities. As well, you know, worth noting here is the oppression of minorities and this, the discrimination against oppressed minorities all prepared the ground for popular insurrections, which we see now as a long-winded kind of revolutionary process. Maybe we can break it down into phase, but it's phases, but it's important to see it as a continuous process. Um, importantly, even though I've highlighted all of the similarities in the region, it is, you know, it's important to not lose the region in kind of one blob. Uh, there is important interactions between these countries, be it Iran's expansionism in the region, the importance of Gulf capital and floating the economies of non-petroleum producing nations, the question of Kurdish self-determination, the movement of refugees in the, move, uh, in the region, migrant labor and others. Uh, each of these really require a talk on their own, and unfortunately, even in the book, we weren't able to go into them in details. The only time we did discuss, discuss them is as they related to the movements themselves. Um, so yeah, so, so the revolutions we see in the region, they need to be understood as attempts to solve these contradictions presented by all of these issues and transcend any simple identity. Uh, they also point to this being a long revolutionary process, as I've mentioned, that will extend beyond the two waves we've witnessed so far. Um, so to talk a bit about the movements themselves and what they share in common, uh, yeah, it, it, it's important to note that all of these uprisings share an understanding that a fundamental restructuring of society is what is needed. None of them are just looking to change the faces at the top. Um, and this includes redistributive demands as well as calls for radical changes in social relations. Uh, these struggles have resulted in revolutionary situations in all the countries, although it remains unclear if they will lead to revolutionary outcomes. This really depends on whether or not the movements themselves can work through some of their own contradictions. Um, another similar characteristic of all these movements is they all share in negative demands. They have the rejection of the various ruling classes or military di dictatorships that run the region straight, uh, states, and they have yet to formulate a definite positive political program on which uh, to, to kind of run on and to push and to, to seize power at the end of the day. Uh, but this tactic is not entirely voluntary. We need to understand that, that most of these countries share in the fact that uh, traditional forces of resistance have previously been crushed. That's the way these ruling classes have been able to maintain their, uh, their power. So these mass movements are missing the strong labor movements or oppositional political parties that usually carry such movements and unify these demands. So the structures of resistance that we see coming to the forefront now uh, represent either shells of previous structures or new and therefore underdeveloped structures. Uh, in certain countries, leaderlessness has certainly been espoused as a strength. Uh, for example, in Lebanon, the slogan of the people do not negotiate, they demand has surfaced, and, and it reflected the rejection of having the movement enter the fold when the government made overtures towards their willingness to negotiate, for example. Now, this does have defensive uses. It, uh, for one, it protected many from the oppressive reach of the government, and it safeguards from co-optation. Uh, but this leaderlessness is not enough, and what's emerging in the form of organization is really worth noting. Uh, a case in point here would be Sudan, which is the only country in which a coalition has emerged and has been able to come to a power-sharing agreement with the military. Uh, the coalition itself is changing, but it represents a wide array of the population, from trade unionists to the Communist Party at one point. Uh, this coalition, which is called the Free Forces of Freedom and Change, was set up by the Sudanese Professional Association, uh, which is a trade union, essentially. Uh, this has led many commentators in the region to take up workplace organizing as the only tool that can promise salvation, but this is mistaken on two uh, counts. First, the SPA itself has been around for several, several years, officially and unofficially, and parallels are hard to find in other countries in the region. Uh, second, this focus on the SPA 
kind of sidelines a more important force in Sudan that needs to be accounted for, which is that of the resistance committees. And these are grassroots informal groups that helped organize protests, actions, and mutual aid on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis and took the lead when the SPA's media was shut down by the government. Uh, and now that the uh, forces of freedom of change are actually in government, it's these resistance committees that continue to make sure that this revolution has a sense of permanence, of continuity, and that the revolution does not succumb to counter revolution. And these sorts of grassroots committees have emerged everywhere in this uprising. Uh, mainly we've seen it in Iraq and Lebanon, although they were unable to coordinate and remain fragmented and politically diverse. So really when we look at the region, we should be looking at these groups and how it is they form and whether or not they're able to create this political, uh, let's say uh, political vision, this positive political pro program to, to push the mass movement forward. It's only then that we can really see these movements re-emerging with the same intensity they had before COVID. Um, that's all I'm gonna say about the movements for now, and I'll leave it to the other speakers to discuss uh, some of the other countries in more detail. Thank you for organizing this event and for giving us this opportunity. And thanks again to Jade who edited the book and who worked, helped us through every step of it with his wonderful questions and comments and ideas. So thank you, Jade. I am not going to really summarize the chapter I wrote for the book um, because I'm sure you've all read it. So I'm just going to single out some points and also talk about newer developments since the, the, the chapter was published. There's no doubt that the, 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 the important and new elements of the 2019 uprising um, that I would say were actually had its roots in the 2017, December 2017 uprising, and then continued until 2020. The, the important and new developments were, I would say three. One was that uh, the, the movement was not asking for reform, but they were asking for the overthrow of the Islamic Republic. And so that was very different from the 2009 Green Movement that just wanted reforms uh, in the laws. And, um, and uh, re uh, new elections. Uh, they uh, uh, involved, they opposed Iran's imperialist intervention in Syria, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, uh, Yemen. Um, so that was very important, unlike the earlier uh, struggles in Iran. And, and, and Syria was definitely a, you know, an important part of the uh, of this uh, struggle of uh, uh, solidarity with Syria and opposition to Iran's intervention in Syria. And third, women, oppressed national minorities and workers were strongly involved in, in these uprisings. And, I, and to some extent, I would even say that women were in the forefront. So uh, the, the problem was that uh, unfortunately with uh, COVID, uh, 19 breaking out. And one of the first places we saw COVID spreading was actually Iran because of Iran's connection to China and Iran's uh, covering it over um, uh, because they wanted to have the, the, pres the parliamentary elections. Um, but with the spread of COVID, it was very difficult for these um, efforts to continue and Iran has suffered tremendously from COVID. The official figures are that over 53,000 people have died, but we know that many, many more have died. And some people even estimate that half the country is already infected, if not sick. But um, the government has been very, uh, at, at first it was very lax about it. And then the regulations were very, very arbitrary and not really enforced. And so as a result, people are dying and suffering. But in general, even, even aside from COVID, the situation in Iran has been dire for a long time and COVID just added to that. So we have the majority of the labor force that's unemployed 
The government claims that the unemployment rate is 25%, but that's because they count even one hour of employment per week as employment. Mm -hmm. And, but it's really more like at least 50, 60% of the labor force is unemployed. They're hungry, they're literally hungry. Food prices are so high that even the most basic food items like bread and cheese um, are just not available. Eggs, meat are, are even out of the question. And uh, uh, air pollution is just unbearable because now Iran is using the unfiltered uh, petroleum uh, for fuel and energy and the, that the pollution that it generates is just unbearable. So friends in Iran that I talked to just say we can't even get out of the apartment and, and the lung problems are just increasing and that is leading to more people getting COVID. So, but despite all of these uh, the, pro the, the struggles are continuing in various forms. So we've had a variety of labor struggles. We've had uh, 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 protests of nurses. We've had the continuing uh, of strikes and protests of sugarcane workers in the southern province of Khuzestan, uh, the Haftape sugarcane workers. Uh, the bus workers were just just recently had a protest a few days ago. The petroleum workers and workers in the petroleum industry, various locations, farmers and retirees, and of course teachers as well. So these these uh, labor actions are continuing, continuing, just asking for for basic basic demands, but also. Um, and I will talk a, a, a bit more about this in the case of half um, really demanding control of production and, and control of the, of the company. Um, the arrests and executions are, are increasing. And um, so a, a year after the November 2019 and January 2020 uprisings, Several working class youth involved on those, in those uprisings have been executed on charges of sedition. And then within the last two weeks alone, over 60 Kurdish civil rights and environmental activists in Kurdistan have been arrested. Kurdish activists have been executed or there are others who are, are, are on, uh, waiting in line. I'm sorry to use that expression, but that's what the government says, um, to be executed. And, uh, uh, and then the whereabouts of a lot of the people who've been arrested is unknown. Uh, women, labor activists and feminist Parvina Mohammadi has gone into hiding to avoid having to serve a one year sentence on charges of sedition, simply for doing labor organizing, and that's called sedition. And then we have the Iranian feminist human rights activists. And of course, Parvina Mohammadi herself is a feminist. Uh, we have uh, uh, feminist human rights activists like uh, 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 Nasrina Sotudeh, who had a brief furlough because of contracting COVID. She's now back in prison, along with many other women's rights activists who have been in prison for challenging the compulsory hijab or for simply having classes for women or advocating women's rights. And then there are also labor, other labor student and environmental activists. Uh, people representing other national minorities, such as the Arab minority, the Baluch minority, um, they're all, you know, they all have activists in prison. In my article uh, for the book, Region in Revolt, I had singled out three shortcomings of Iranian socialists which have really stood in the way of forward movement for the liberatory struggle in Iran. And those were one, statism, two, Iranian nationalism, and three, sexism. I had also pointed out the problem of, of lack of international solidarity. The fact that, not that the international solidarity doesn't exist, clearly this group is an exa a beautiful example of it. And there are other socialists who have really made an effort to express their solidarity. But in general, as a whole, the, the global left has 
mostly accepted the Iranian regime's um, anti-imperialist language, anti-US imperialist language, and it has muzzled its criticism of, of, of the Iranian regime, if not, in the, in the, uh, if, if it even has one. Um, but there are some new developments that I think can help us challenge these problems. And I'd like to point them out. Um, new developments uh, within Iran and also developments concerning international solidarity. And I'd like to point out four of them and then I'll stop. How much time do I have left? Sorry, P, I don't know if you've been. How, how much time do I have left? I've not, um, I think, um, I'm not actually quite sure, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think I think maybe two, three minutes. Okay, okay, I'll be quick. So the four, four developments are first that, um, although most labor uh, protests have focused on the question of opposing privatization, and that's been problematic in the sense that it makes, gives the impression that simply having the government take over a company would solve the labor problems. Uh, there, uh, there are some really important discussions going on right now, especially within the Haftape workers who are saying that, uh, you know, even when we had government ownership of Haftape, we still had worker exploitation of workers. We still had austerity measures. So simply asking the ownership to switch from the so-called so private, well, private, I mean so-called because these private owners are really government um, contractors, but simply having ownership switch from private or contractors to back to the government will not solve the problem that we really need to discuss worker control of production. And that is not the same as having um, cooperatives even, or just uh, the idea that some had proposed within the government itself too of, of having workers buy shares of their company and become share owners. So that's been a very positive development happening within workers themselves. Secondly, there, uh, uh, recently, a, a documentary film has been produced about the Iranian feminist human rights activist Nasrina Sotudeh, uh, which really shows her as the symbol of, of all women's struggles inside Iran, as well as struggles of national minorities, of workers, and the struggle against the um, prison system. And uh, in a way, you can say abolitionism. And that film has been made by two US uh, um, filmmakers who are both leftist progressives, uh, Jeff Kaufman and Marsha Ross, uh, who came up with the idea themselves. They, they read about that sister today and said, oh, she would be a great model for us. Let's make a documentary about her. And then they collaborated with friends inside Iran to get footage and they made this beautiful documentary. So I would highly recommend that to everyone who wants to express solidarity with Iran. You can show that to your group and have a Zoom discussion on it. And you learn a lot about Iranian struggles as a whole. It's not only about Sotudeh. A uh, third development is that um, we have uh, a statement. Um, I, um, we have, um, I, I, don't, I don't want to call it a statement. I wrote an article about Harvina Mohammadi, the Iranian feminist uh, labor leader who is now in hiding. Uh, and um, um, because she, uh, she got a, uh, she received a, a text message saying that she's been sentenced to a year in prison for so-called sedition. I wrote an article based on a biography of her that I received from inside Iran that was recounted by herself. And uh, this article, I, I, I really, really see it more of a as a statement by herself because most of what I said in the article is from her. And it's, it shows you how unique she is as a, as a woman labor leader who's been, in, in, uh, been a worker since she was you know, 18 years old, comes from a working class family, but is also a feminist, doesn't see any contradiction between the two. She's just an amazing woman. I don't, honestly, in the entirety of the Middle East region, I don't know anybody like her. 
we need to make a heroine out of her. We need to publicize her case. So I'd be happy to share that article with you. And that would be a great way to do a solidarity work. And the fourth development is that we now have a budding Me Too movement in Iran against femicide, against uh, sexual violence, sexual harassment, and that it's um, and that some uh, socialist women, a particular one um, that has been publishing interviews also with working women, class women and homeless women, are really trying to expand it so that it's not. It's not only about middle class women um, telling stories about sexual harassment, which are extremely important. I'm not putting that down when I say that, but it also involves working class women and homeless women talking about sexual assault and violence. So we do have that budding Me Too movement that can, can talk, can have a conversation with the global Me Too movement against gender violence and also with the abolitionist movement, because in Iran, there is a similarity between the situation that women face when, when trying to uh, find justice after they've been subjected to sexual violence and the situations, for instance, that African-American women face in the US when they experience sexual violence from a partner, but they also don't want to go to the police because what would the police do? put the person in prison and prison is not a per place where this person can really be corrected or improved. And um, women in Iran too, a lot of them feel that they don't, they, what, do they, what should they do? Go complain to the Islamic Republic, which doesn't care about them in the first place. And what is the Islamic going to, Republic going to do? At, at most, put the person in prison uh, or, or hang them? That is not the solution. So there is a, some um, basis for dialogue between um, abolitionist feminists in the US and I would say the Me Too movement in Iran. So on the basis of all those issues, I think we can make progress in dealing with these problems uh, that have not been um, addressed by, the, uh, by Iranian socialists. And um, I will stop at this point and look forward to having more um, dialogue during the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, hey everyone. Um, so Jad and I wrote this book a chapter on Lebanon as part of this book, obviously. And we stopped, uh, well, when we had to publish. So that was around, I think, May 2020, or at least that's that's the outline. And obviously, three months later, we had the, the, the massive explosion in the port of Beirut. And one thing that I was wondering when that happened, or, you know, after trying to recover from the shock of it all, obviously, is like what how would we have updated the chapter uh had we let's say published it uh, a month later or whatever and the truth of the matter is that all we would say is that things are even worse than they were before august it just kind of it's over this acceleration uh, process the trouble was speaking about um you know first wave second wave uh, who gets to decide what what, when did Arab Spring 1.0 stop in the first place and when did 2.0 start, you know, these are pretty, uh, they can be useful categories if we want to simplify things, but for the various reasons that Jad mentioned uh, before, I, I personally also don't really use it. I just say the 2011 uprisings and then the 2019 uprisings and so on, just to make it simpler. Right now we're seeing a number of um, interrelated crises happening in Lebanon. You have the economic crisis, which is both linked to the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously, but it also precedes it. It was actually one of the triggers, if not the main trigger for the October um, 2019 uprising slash revolution slash however people want to call it. Um, and they haven't gone away. If anything, they've gotten significantly worse. I actually don't know what's the latest updates on how much the currency has been devaluated. I think something like 80 percent, just correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a really significant number. And unemployment is through the roof, and that's in addition uh, to the obvious uh, lockdown, which, even though necessary, is not coupled with any kind of financial assistance. And so part of the outcome of that, obviously, is what we've been seeing in Tripoli, in Trablos, the, the major city of the north of Lebanon, where you've had protests more or less on and off for the past uh, couple of weeks or so now. And these protests, I feel, in my opinion, and we did make that uh, point in the book chapter, uh, 
are as revealing, if not more revealing than the protests that were happening in Beirut. And the reason is very simple, is that Tripoli by and large has much less support than the average Beirut protester. And the reason for that is very complicated. I may not get into all of it, but it's a summary. It's a mix, let's say, of, uh, well, anti-working class sentiment. Tripoli is a very poor city. I would also include in that the uh, post 9-11 war on terror narrative, as a lot of the extremist movements have been in Tripoli. Or to qualify that, uh, extremist movements that were in and around Tripoli and or in and around Syria of uh, often being conflated by people who just hate them in the first place. So Tripoli is kind of on its own, if that makes much sense. I, I'm, I'm gonna try not get too much into the details because I can get bogged down myself. But it's the city I look for um, in some ways the most closely other than obviously other than Beirut. Beirut in many ways, it's easier to understand. Um, you know, I grew up there, but it's easier to understand than Tripoli because Tripoli has all of these additional layers of complications that, that Beirut does. Another region that both Jad and I focused on in the book chapter is Nawati in the South. Now Nawati in the South has, um, and you know, just for the relevance, because we are talking about the sectarian system, Tripoli is Sunni majority and Nabati is Shia majority, which I'm only mentioning for the, for the purpose of this conversation. Nabati has been relatively calm in the past uh, few months or so, largely again due to COVID, the economic crisis and everything. But in the early days and the early couple, I would say early six or so weeks of the 2019 uprising, so from October, November, early December, more or less, I think, um, we saw a pretty significant momentum happening in Nabati year. And we did have sort of like back and forth between uh, Nabati in the South and Tripoli in the North, which was highly symbolic as again, the Sunni majority and Shia majority areas, both sort of vied by these uh, rival political parties that are usually more often than not allies and then not allies and then allies and then not allies back and forth. So in the case of Nabati, obviously I'm speaking about Hezbollah and the Amman movement. In the case of Tripoli, I'm speaking more or less largely about Hariri, although there are other contenders as well in that region. And I would say that the hegemony of Hezbollah in the south is stronger than the hegemony of Hariri in the north. We've been seeing these cracks since October 19, uh, sorry, October 2019. People in Tripoli are actually openly denouncing Hariri. We have seen a bit of that in the south, but less of that. And that, I think, is, uh, speaks to the power differential between Hezbollah and Hariri in this specific case. But kind of more broadly speaking, these combination, these um, interrelated problems that I'm just kind of listing here, and I'm, I'm forgetting a lot of them, I'm not going to mention all of them, it's just very complicated. They often sort of sit below the surface, and it doesn't take much for them to get back to the surface, kind of bo boil out. The question is, as Jad mentioned before, uh, that one of the problems is that most of the demands that are usually, that usually happen are negative demands. Now, I wouldn't be too harsh on the people who have negative demands. It's a very difficult situation, and it is uh, you know, for better or worse, it is very obvious that there has to be structural changes and also that very specific people have to leave. It's very difficult to have these structural changes without these specific people leaving. And they happen to all be in government, obviously. Or there are a few of them that are not technically in government, but they are in government. It's, it's complicated. And the difficulty with that is that you don't have one. You don't have one dictator to overthrow, which is difficult as it is. Don't get me wrong but it's more diffused. And because it's more diffused, you have a, a, a more complicated in some ways, or at least more uh, com difficult to understand, I, th I think for the average protester, average activist, I, you know, just speaking for myself, um, a diff more difficult political economy to understand. It's not just about hitting, you know, the kind of cutting off the head of the hydra kind of thing. You, you do have middlemen, you have people that depend on, on political parties, you have people who, let's say, don't necessarily, um, 100 believe in everything Hezbollah does, but are economically dependent on Hezbollah and those specific uh, regions. And that's just one example. It, it's across the board. So my question, my, what I've been wondering, uh, sort of kind of to zoom out in a sense, is what happens to the so-called post-war consensus? And I'll sort of sum up my, my thought in this. Lebanon, very sim like simplifying here, has had more or less waves of history, if you want, that are more or less 15 years of time period, more or less. You have obviously independence in 1943, and then in 1948, a lot of things happened in those, between those dates, but I'm again sum summarizing. You had the, um, the, the, the 1958 conflict, I think it's just called in English. 
And that was in the context of pan-Arabism and then uh, on the kind of the op opposing side, Lebanese nationalism and certain things in between, it was on that clear cut. Obviously in 1975, we had the eruption of what would then be called the civil war. I usually call it just civil wars or Lebanese wars because there were multiple uh, wars in one. We just call it that because obviously it's simpler to just say civil war. And they were interrelated, not that they were not connected. In 1990, we saw the ushering in of the Ta'if Agreement, signed in, in 1989, I think, and implemented in 1990 or early 1991 or something like that. And since then, under, uh, I should say, under Syrian quote-unquote tutelage, so the, the military occupation of the Assad regime, and in the south of Lebanon, you had the military occupation of the Israeli regime, obviously. But in the rest of Lebanon, what would be called the Lebanese government, it was the Assad regime. And so between 1990 and 2005, you had the so-called reconstruction of Lebanon. This was done under a neoliberal framework. It was done through this company called Solidaire. Again, summarizing quickly here, this company called Solidaire, which was a, a, was is a mix of private slash public, essentially a corporation given free reign by the government and which happened to be owned by the then prime minister. And this was done through, again, the, the permission, if you want, or uh, over, overview or whatever. Um, like the Syrian regime was overseeing this, this development. 2005, you had the obvious assassination of Rafik al-Hariri, and this is when some people say like the post-war era ended. Like, again, this is very simplif simpl simplified. One might sim simply argue like what, when did it ever end if you had two separate military occupation after it quote unquote ended. But the Ta'if agreement that ended the war was first challenged in 2005 when Rafik Hariri, the prime minister was assassinated. And I would argue, jumping and oversimplifying everything, obviously, that we are sort of seeing a challenge to that post-war consensus happening right now, even much more so than in 2005. In 2005, you had the established powers sort of realigning into what would then be called the March 8 and the March 14 movement. Roughly speaking, Hezbollah is dom dominates the March 8 movement and the Free Patriotic movement. And March 14 is dominated by Rafik Hariri and the Lebanese forces and um, Walid Jumblad on and off. It's very complicated. But that consensus is, or that power sharing agreement has seen its cracks in the past few years. In the recent elections, they sort of came together to defeat this uh, largely independent group of technocrats, like liberals, some progressives. Uh, they had to, the government had to basically unite to defeat them in the Beirut municipal elections, which they ended up doing because there is the, um, what's it called, like the first Pass the vote, pass the post vote, or whatever it's called. So basically, they, they took all of their votes, even though they, they only had 60% or so of the votes, I think. So, anyway, now what we're seeing now, since 2019 and with the events of 2020, in my opinion, is a re questioning or a re evaluation of what we might call the Ta'if consensus. Ta'if being the city in Saudi Arabia where they signed the end of the civil war, what would be the end of the civil war, quote unquote. And that's one of the interesting developments that I think has been happening. Now, I'm choosing to focus on this because if I focus too much on everything that's bad right now, I will take up all of your time and I don't think we will really learn much. The situation is very bad. There's absolutely no sugarcoating it. It's getting worse. It's going to definitely get worse for the foreseeable future. I think that's really easy to say, easy to predict. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Uh, and that's like, I would say this even before the pandemic and before the blast. <laughs> so like that accelerates it and, and worsened it on a scale that is frankly very difficult to cut, to still comprehend, comprehend even to this day. So now we're in early 2021, I will stop here. And we're seeing all of these questions, some of, most of which I actually had not, did not have time to get into, of course, from class dynamics to gender dynamics to racial dynamics, I would even argue there are quite a lot of that, mixing in with sectarian dynamics that were already there and sectarianism itself, the political economy of sectarianism being in itself a form of uh, I think you can just call it like a sectarian neoliberalism that was implemented after 1990, which was different before the war, and it took a different um, dimension after the war. So I'll stop that. I apologize for rambling. As I said, um, I, I have to jump back and forth between certain dates because they're not very easy to summarize and difficult to talk about 2021 before, without 2019. And, you know, you can go back and forth and all of that. So anyway, thank you for listening. And uh, I think the discussion is going to be fun.